Good morning, Faith Bridge. Steve Carter here, and it is an honor to have the privilege to uh, teach in such uncharted waters. I don't know about you, um, but even last weekend as I tuned in and watched uh, Pastor Ken just remind us that victory is here, it, it really spoke to me uh, because if you're like me, you're just experiencing kind of this rush of different emotions and feelings. Uh, a sense of unknown, a sense of, oh man, crisis, uh, a sense of just financial struggles, um, a sense of just turning your house into a homeschool, and just maybe even feeling a little stir crazy. All of these emotions. And for many sincere Christ followers, in the face of crisis, when circumstances just seem so out of hand, there's often one thing that we forget, and it's to remain in Christ. If you, if you look at five chapters in the book of John, John 13 through John 17, um, right square in the middle is John 15. And, and you know John 13, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, him kind of talking about communion, him telling us literally that one person kind of reclining at the table is going to um, betray him. And we know that to be Judas. John uh, 14 is, is Jesus talking about uh, the Father and the Spirit. And then we skip to John chapter 16. He's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. And then John chapter 17 is him praying for all of the believers, for the disciples and praying that we would have unity, but right square in the middle. And scholars believe this, that Jesus kind of leaves the upper room, begins to walk down the Kidron Valley as he heads to the garden in Gethsemane, but he stops at a vineyard and he wants to remind his listeners, his disciples of one true message. And it's this. John 15, one through 10 says this, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Ten times in ten verses, Jesus uses one word, and that word is remain. And maybe your translation say abide. Uh, but you got to know that remain or abide and abide comes from the word abode and it literally means to make your home in. And this is what Jesus is saying. No matter what circumstance, no matter what crisis, the invitation is for us to remain in him. Today, I want to teach you three essentials from the vineyard on how you can keep the remain thing the main thing. Because Jesus has the cross in purview. He knows where he's going, and yet he takes a moment in front of his disciples to say, hey, guys, 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 here's what I need you to understand. It's going to get crazy. It's going to be a little bit uh, difficult at times. But I promise you, if you can remain in me, if you can keep the remain thing the main thing, you will bear much fruit. A number of years ago, I had the privilege to go to South Africa. 
And uh, we were going to do all of this missionary work, and, and I was really, really excited because we were kind of serving some really low-income um, schools. But right next to one of the places and orphanages that we were kind of serving was a vineyard. And because of there being so many kids at this orphanage, um, there wasn't enough uh, beds for us, which I totally understood. And so kind of the person came up to us and said, hey, uh, we don't got enough room for you. And so um, you can go in town and stay at a hotel or um, there's a vineyard next door that you can stay there. A number of my buddies went in town and stayed at the hotel, but I was like, I want to stay at the vineyard. And so I found myself like staying overnight in this vineyard. And every morning I woke up super early. I read John 15 and then I walked out into the vineyard and I just basically followed, harassed, stalked the gardener. And I just began to pepper this poor man with questions. And he was so gracious and he was so kind. But I'll tell you what, I see John 15 in incredibly new ways due to what this vine dresser taught me. Now, the three essentials to keep the remain thing the main thing begins with number one. You have to trust the pruning. I love how John 15 begins. It says, I am the true vine. And you got to understand, the vine was the nationalistic symbol. It's kind of like our bald eagle. You hear about it in Isaiah 5 and Psalms 80, Ezekiel, Hosea, Jeremiah, they all talk about this. And the vine was symbolic of favor and blessing. Even on the top of King Herod's temple, there were these six foot grape gold clusters because they wanted everybody as they approached the temple to understand that God can bless. God has provided the Hebrew people favor. And Jesus just literally comes out of the gate and says, hey, disciples, Talmudim, students, I'm the true vine. And oh yeah, my father's the gardener. And then he begins to talk about how this gardener is going to literally prune. And what I've come to realize when I found myself waking up early and following this vine dresser around, I started to ask him, what does pruning look like? He told me that there's two types of ways that a gardener prunes a vine. The first one is essential for us to understand. It's called thinning out. Now, I'm gonna go to the whiteboard and I need you to understand my wife is an artist and you're gonna really be able to clearly see um, really where she gets her inspiration as an artist. So here we go, I'm gonna try and draw for you a vine. So I found myself talking to this gardener and this is what I learned. Now, again, just, just see the glory of this vine. This is a vine kind of like trunk, all right? And, and a vine, it, all of its branches literally wanna grow and they just wanna grow as fast as they can. And what, a, what a, a vine dresser and gardener has to be able to do is it has to be able to begin to look at the branches on a vine and begin to inspect them. And literally, the first kind of way of pruning is what they call thinning out. Because they gotta be able to go through and say, is this branch going to be able to handle the elements? Is this branch literally going to bear the best kind of fruit? But here's the thing. The vine dresser understands that this vine only has so many units of energy to literally kind of give to each branch. And it doesn't want it to kind of be um, kind of broken up for hundreds of branches. And so this vine dresser inspects and then begins to thin out. So all of that special like energy and sustenance can go to the strongest branches. Quick time out. When I look at this vine and I look at all of these branches, you know what I really think? <laughs> it looks really similar to my life. I, I have so many things that I am doing and I'm not able to give my very best. Sometimes I'm just kind of giving leftovers to some relationships. 
And often what the gardener wants to do is just say, man, are there places in our life where we need to thin out? Maybe for some of you in this past season, you felt overwhelmed, kind of just overscheduled, overworked, literally just over it. And the gardener literally wants to kind of come in and just say, hey, let's just thin some stuff out. Can I tell you one of the most sacred acts that you can ever do is how you arrange your schedule. Because literally, how you arrange your schedule literally proclaims with your one and only life what you really value. And so I hear a lot of people say, this is what I want for my life with God, or this is what I desire in my relationship with God. But then when I look at their schedule, it looks like this. And really, deep down, there's not even those times where people are literally spending time in the presence of God. If we're gonna trust the pruning so that we can keep the remain thing the main thing, what does God need to thin out in your life? I think one of the unique benefits of COVID-19 is literally we are all almost being grounded at home. We are all having this amazing opportunity to literally look at our schedules and say, what is the most important? Our faith, our family, and how are we prioritizing? I'm honestly believing that this season can really transform my family, can transform our churches to have the right priorities. But it begins when we keep the remain thing, the main thing, by number one, trusting the pruning. Let's go to the second. The second essential to keep the remain thing, the main thing, is that we must trust the process. Now, I'm a huge Chicago Cubs fan. And for 108 years, we did not win the World Series. It was painful. And then we hired Theo Epstein. He came from the Boston Red Sox to become our general manager. And he had brought some World Series to Boston. And so, at one of his first press conferences, he used this phrase, you just have to trust the process. And this is what they were going to do. They were going to develop their farm system. They were going to like kind of buy some great pitching. They were going to scout. They were going to bring in kind of the best coaches. And he said, if you can give us a, a, a few years, if you can literally trust the process, we will win the World Series. And in 2016, we did. It was incredible. Now, I think for many of us, we struggle with trusting the process. A mentor once told me that God's three answers often to our prayers are yes, no, and not now. And I don't know about you, but I struggle when I hear not now. Uh, and especially sometimes when I look to the right, and I look to the left, I look at my neighbors, I, I start scrolling on social media, and I start seeing what everybody else seems to have, and I hear God say, not now, not now, not now. But why them? Why are they getting married? Why are they getting a promotion? Why in the season of, of crisis does it seem from social media that, they, that they're thriving and flourishing, but why me? And for many of us, in the midst of crisis and in the midst of hearing not now, we don't know what to do. So I started asking this, this vine dresser about this. I said, okay, so one way of pruning is all about kind of thinning out. What's the other? And he told me, he said, it's called pinching. I'm going to go back. I'm going to show you what pinching is all about. So you remember, you've got the vine right here. And you know, it just, again, this is, it's just so obvious what this is. Um, but you'll see just kind of a, a, a beautiful kind of vine with branches. And you've got these little kind of shoots 
of grapes that are wanting to like literally start to kind of uh, bloom. And, and in the branch, it's, it's like it's wanting to kind of produce. I think this is like many of our lives. We have these ideas within us and we just want them to kind of come to fruition. And we can look overnight on kind of in the media, kind of in culture, like bands, and it just seems like overnight they bloom. And doesn't this look really good? I'm just gonna sign it right now because I just feel that like, that's a, that's a piece of art, Faithbridge. You're lucky, you're lucky. Now, when I see this, what I felt like the gardener told me is that he literally would come up to a shoot because he realized this branch is wanting to bloom too soon. And they came up to it and they just pinched it. Not now, not now. Because if it blooms too soon and all of a sudden a freeze comes, this branch and these grapes won't be strong enough and it literally, it literally will not produce the best kind of fruit. And it won't create the best kind of grapes. And oftentimes, when I start to look in somebody else's vine, somebody else's branch, and I see all of what they are producing, I could find myself getting quite envious. And honestly, one of the things when we keep the remain thing the main thing is we have to learn to trust the process. Let me take this even farther. When I say take it farther, you gotta understand that a vine would produce grapes and those grapes were used for something. They were used for the ability to make wine. I found myself just walking with this gardener and I look at him and I say, okay, okay, when you put the seeds in the ground, how long until a vine produces fruit? The vine dresser just looks at me and goes, oh, that's easy, three years. Just real, real quick, how long was Jesus with his disciples? Three years. And he's literally coming to like the crux of the story that is leading to the cross. He stops in a vineyard and he says, hey, hey, guys, guys, let me tell you, you all know this. You all know this, but you got to trust the process. And for three years, you have been following me. You have been learning from me. I have been teaching you. Now, if you remain in me, you are going to bear the best kind of fruit. See, what's crazy though, is I think for some of us, we quit too soon. When we hear not now, we just kind of like, oh man, if I can't have it my way, right away, I don't want it. But have you ever, have you ever walked through the grocery store and maybe just saw a bottle of wine? And if, if, if you think about this, 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 this did not just happen overnight. And here's the truth, friends. You cannot microwave spiritual formation. It takes time. And when you trust the process, God is going to work everything out for good. Just think about a good bottle of wine. If it takes three years from seeds to begin to produce fruit, then they're taking those grapes and they're beginning to put it through a fermentation process. Then they bottle it, and then all of a sudden, it kind of sits on a shelf until you walk down that aisle and say, I would like that bottle of wine. You take that bottle of wine, and if it's a good bottle of wine, and you've got you know, a Houston wine cellar, you then take that bottle of wine, and it sits for a few years. And a vine dresser tells me that a very good bottle of wine, from like the very beginning, until until you enjoy it takes nine years. Nine years. And, and I've been a pastor for almost 20 years. And I've had moments where I've sat in my office and I've listened to people tell stories about the circumstances and the struggles and the times in which God's literally saying, not now, not now. And it's an act of grace because he's telling them, not now, not now, because I actually have a better vision for your life. 
I have a better vision for what this bottle of wine is going to be, what story it's going to tell. And sometimes I'm hearing these stories and I just will stop and I'll look at the couple or I'll look at the person and I'll just say, I know trusting the process is hard, but I kid you not, if you keep going, you will experience an incredible bottle of wine. And someday, when you get to the other side, when you get to the other side of the wilderness, of the uncertainty, of the desert, of the wild, of the unknown, and you were able to survive, and God was able to do something because you trusted the pruning and you trusted the promise, the process, and you were able to keep the remain thing, the main thing, you are going to have an incredible story to tell. How are you doing right now at trusting the process? Are you trusting that your gardener has a grander vision for what your life can be? The third, the third essential to keep the remain thing, the main thing is that you must trust the promise. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Can I be really, really honest? I think for many of us, if we really, really just honest with our lives, I think we say, no, Jesus, I'm the vine and you are a branch. And if you were like connected to me, I want you to actually bear something good in my life. And Jesus is like flipping it, saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm the vine. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. And this is like sustainable fruit. This is like fruit that like lasts more than just a season. This is long lasting fruit. This is legacy making fruit. Because I think every one of us, we want to leave a good legacy for our kids for our grandkids, for the Faith Bridge family. We wanna be the kind of people that are held in high esteem and, and with high regard. And Jesus says, if you keep the remain thing, the main thing, here's my promise to you. You will bear long lasting fruit. But apart from me, you will do nothing. Nothing that's sustainable. Nothing that flourishes in a way that brings honor and glory to God and to his kingdom. And this is my prayer. This is my prayer for every one of you that call Faith Bridge home or, or who are tuning in online and watching this message. I'm praying that if you can keep the remain thing the main thing, if you can learn to trust the pruning and trust the process and trust the promise, that if you remain, you will bear much fruit. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you that there's someone watching right now going, yeah, that's really nice for a pastor to say. I mean, I bet your life, Steve, is just like super easy. And um, yeah, you, you don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. You don't know the ways that I've train wrecked my marriage or sabotaged my relationships with my kids or just kind of blown up my friendships or, or literally because of addiction or struggle or pain. I have just, just made a mess with my life. So don't give me this trust the promise thing. Don't give me this false hope of a legacy. And can I bring you back to the vineyard? Can I bring you right back to the gardener? I remember asking this one question going, hey, how do you make kind of these new um, variations of wine and grapes? And he told me, about grafting. Stay with me, friends, because I think for some of you watching this, this is a word for you, that God is not through with you. Back to the board, because I got to draw this out. So I walk into this gardener and I'm like, hey, so tell me about grafting. And so this is what he says he does. If they want to make like a new variation of grapes, 
what they'll do is they'll take the vine, kind of the trunk of the vine, and they'll cut it from the top so there's no branches. And this is the language that he literally uses. He says, what we do is we wait for the top of the, of the vine trunk to literally weep and bleed, to weep and bleed. And then what we do is we literally put a tea cut in the center. I'm not making this up. He says a tea cut in the center. And then we take the seeds of the new kind of uh, grape that we want to kind of graft in. And after a few days, we place them inside the tea cut and we bandage it up. And after a couple days, we remove it, we take care of it, we tend it, and then within a few years, it is bearing a new kind of grape. And then the vine dresser looks at me and goes, what do you think about that? And I'm like, you wanna know what I think about that? I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher. When I hear that, I think it's the gospel. It is the good news, because let's be really, really honest. Before I knew Jesus, I was broken, I struggled, I had pride, had all of these issues in my story of abandonment and neglect. And yet, the cross and the story of Jesus is us taking all of our patterns of dysfunction, brokenness, all of the places that we live less than, that God intended, all of my sin, and we have placed it right square on that tea cut, which we would refer to as the cross. And you know what Jesus does? He takes it all. He takes it all. And you know what begins to happen? It's like through his spirit, instead of living a life of fear, he gives me a spirit of love. Instead of like giving me a life filled with just kind of despair, he gives me a life of hope. Instead of just giving me like the sense of anger and hatred, he's given me kindness and goodness. Instead of just giving me the sense of pride, he's given me a spirit of gentleness. Instead of like giving me kind of and holding on to all of this like impatience, he gives me patience. And in a whole life where I couldn't even control and manage my own desires, he's given me a spirit of self-control. And friends, literally, your life right now, if you choose, you could literally begin today to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, to begin to cultivate a new kind of wine. And this is what Jesus wants to do in you. But it begins with one word, trust. Are you willing to trust the pruning? Trust the process and trust the promise that apart from him, you can do nothing, but with him, you can bear the best kind of fruit. And it begins today when you decide to keep the remain thing the main thing. My friends at FaithBridge, I love you. I believe that God is not done with you. I believe that even in the midst of crazy and the crisis and COVID-19 and all of these circumstances, what if we were a church that said, we will keep the remain thing the main thing? What if we were a church that said, we want to bear the best kind of fruit even in a season like this? What might God do throughout Spring, Texas and all of greater Houston? Because we said, we will trust the gardener. We will trust the pruning. We will trust the process. We will trust the promise. And we will allow ourselves to be the church, the kind of church that will bring glory and honor to God. I love you, Faith Bridge. It's an honor, an honor to open up God's word and I'm praying his blessings and favor upon you. Grace and peace.